We should be live. All right, we'd like to welcome you to Connecting Eyes to Oceans here. I have uh, Anika and Kurt here with me today, our, uh, our hosts for the day. Um, we'll start off, I suppose, by getting you guys to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your underwater experience and marine experience. Okay. Uh, hi, my name's Kurt. I'm a marine ecologist. I work at Murdoch University. I specialise in fish ecology, uh, been doing a lot of work in estuaries lately and then also on some of the artificial reefs. Uh, around this region here. So we've been studying, uh, I suppose, the communities of fish that live in this system. And I've also been diving since I've been a, a little tacker and fishing since I was, uh, before I could walk. So hopefully be able to identify a lot of the fish for you and tell you a bit about the uh, ecosystem. Thanks, Kurt. Hi, I'm Annika. I've got a diving background and I've done some work um, in marine conservation. So I don't have the same science background that Kurt does, but um, should be able to keep you entertained and uh, prompt Kurt to give you a, a good lowdown of what we're seeing today. We're just waiting on the divers to jump in the water here at the moment, guys. Um, what can we hopefully expect to see today? Uh, well, at the moment, we're, so we're in like the subtropical region, uh, getting on borderline the temperate region. So we'll be seeing mostly temperate region fish. Uh, and in terms of algae, it'll be like a lot of colonia radiata and some seagrasses. Uh, so it'll be pretty interesting to see those kind of stuff. Um, we might have the odd chance of seeing a trop tropical fish. So what are subtropical regions, I suppose the intermediate zone between tropical, which is like your Great Barrier Reef or your Ningaloo Reef, because uh, we're on the west coast here, uh, those uh, types of fish to our temperate species of fish, which you would see down in uh, more of the uh, lower capes of, of Western Australia. So uh, I'm not sure what kind of uh, terrain we're diving on today, but usually around this area is a lot of limestone reef. Uh, so hopefully we see a few caves and we might see some cave dwelling uh, species uh, or otherwise I'm not sure if we're on seagrass where it's also an important habitat for many different types of uh, fauna. Yeah, so the caves make for pretty interesting diving and what about um, in terms of the ecosystem? Do they have an important part to play in the ecosystem here? Oh definitely, so it's, they provide a lot of habitat uh, for either for invertebrates uh, which is also includes like your crayfish or lobsters. Um, the lobsters over this side uh, of Australia, uh, sorry, well this part of the world, uh, don't usually have claws. Uh, for a lot of the American viewers over there, I know a lot of them do have claws. Uh, there are some still small invertebrates that do have claws, but they don't get much bigger than that. So uh, the ones here, uh, yeah, I suppose clawless. So they, they mainly live uh, in ledges or caves. Uh, and then that also provides, caves also provide a lot of shelter uh, for a lot of uh, fish as well um, and then also they provide a substrate for different types of algae to be able to grow onto and then you get your herbivorous fish that feed them or feed on the algae there or they even lay all their eggs um, or however they breed on, on that kind of structure so Wow, so a pretty important part of the ecosystem. So would you say that um, in this area there's a lot of seagrass? We're pretty blessed for having quite a good seagrass bed here off the coast of Perth, aren't we? Yeah, we are. So they, uh, we're very lucky in Australia to have some of the biggest seagrass meadows in the world. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think the biggest one's in Shark Bay, which is only a few hours north of here. Uh, and then one of the other biggest ones is Geograph Bay, which is only a few hours south. Uh, which we still have a lot of seagrass here as well. Um, which which is pretty awesome to, to have because that's a vital part for uh, not only habitat uh, for, for fish uh, and other sea creatures, uh, but it's also an important part for putting uh, soaking up carbon uh, in for, from the atmosphere in the in the world as well. So great. And is the seagrass looking healthy? Uh, yeah. Well, we'll see when we get down there. <laughs> we will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there has been a lot of work in uh, restoring seagrass uh, in this part of the world, uh, especially in this sort of regions around here. Uh, there has been some uh, times in the past where either heat waves or certain uh, things that have happened that it has wiped out large chunks of seagrass. 
um, and then, but there's still huge amounts of it around, and then there's been a lot of work into it in terms of restoring it. So, well, I'm hoping it looks, it's going to look pretty healthy down there. <laughs> Great. So we might be looking at a lot of seagrass today, but there's a lot going on in that grass. Oh, definitely, definitely, and there's quite a few species of seagrass as well. Um, I think I could name about five, but uh, I think there's. Oh, Actually, I might not know the amount, actual amount. There might be 13 species in total. Impressive. Maybe that might be worldwide. Um, but so yeah. that's just the seagrass. That's not including seaweed. What's the difference between seagrass and seaweed? So seaweed's like is an algae, uh, where seagrass is actually more like a uh, a grass that you get on land. So it has like its rhizomes, uh, and it's actually a, the only flowering plant. Well, it's kind of like a plant, I guess, because it's the only flowering plant that's underwater. Um, and it does get like pollinated like plants do uh, out, out, out on, on land. So oh, they so do how, have... How does can, the pollination work? So a lot of like, you get, I suppose, uh, copepods, uh, well, little invertebrates that swim through the water column will uh, pick up, I don't know, the, the stigmas or from the anthers of the plant. I think they have that. I'm not sure if that's just terrestrial plants. But I suppose you could call them like underwater bees and they'll go around and pollinate other parts of the plant where they're, well, they're the flower that they have underwater and then the seed will, uh, depending on the type of seagrass, but most of them have like a, a seed that sort of goes and floats off and drifts off in the current, then situates itself down somewhere else and then uh, grows like that. And then wow. starts again. So it's, yeah, well, seagrass no is <laughs> super complex. Um, but yeah, very, very interesting. and. Um, they're not just a, a boring looking green uh, gra see green thing, it's got they've got a huge uh, importance in, in the ecosystem. Wow, okay. Thank you. Great explanation. <laughs> so the divers are in the water? The divers are in. We are just getting the uh, the camera connected for some reason it it actually disconnected we've been watching it for the last hour and now it seems to have decided that it's going to uh, stop mm. working um, which of course is always the case in a uh, situation like this <laughs> um, let's see if we can switch to the other camera see if we can uh, have you guys walk them out and have a look at what's going on yeah, let's take a tour. Alright, alright. Who wants to be in charge of this while I keep working on uh, this? Here we are. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, one out, one out. You can have a chat to the divers. Um, I think two of them are already under. Alright, let's go check out the boat. So we're a couple of k's off the coast of Perth here. Out of Pindari Marina. This is Dave, our head diver. We've got uh, two divers in the water already. Let's gather around see what we can see. Captain Rob. Good morning. <laughs> Thanks for taking us out, Rob. Good evening. Good afternoon if you're in America. <laughs> so, conditions today are pretty good. We've got a bit of smog from a bushfire that's happening on the coast. What's it like underwater? Do you think there's much visibility today? Uh, it's gonna, it's, from what I've seen so far, it's uh, going to be good to have the cameras on the camera, uh, cam uh, torches on the camera, because uh, it's not great visibility, but um, hopefully the sun will come out shortly and that should improve. Um, but yeah, we've got two divers down there now, and. Uh, We'll, uh, we'll soon see how good it looks. <laughs> Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Shot a bit of the equipment. Alright, so, so what are we working with today? Don't know what the camera is, but that's the live stream camera that goes underwater. And that Dave will be swimming around me showing us what's on there down there. Yeah. Beautiful. You can see there's some quite common buoyancy. Reeling it out over here. And this is one of our comms masks here, we've got two of these. So that's a full face dive mask, um, so that would replace a dive mask. And there is a speaker up here. Um, and there's a button there just at the mouth 
the guiders can press that to speed the bus. And that sort of functions as a regulator too. Everyone that makes a bit of that with diving. Alright, there's your drivers on the surface. I think worse. <laughs> Has a visibility! Hello! <laughs> <laughs> We've had pretty good conditions here the last few days. Normally a bit of wind will stir up the visibility. Um, well, it looks like we've just got a bit of lack of light penetration. There's not much light coming through because of this bush smoke. Makes for a pretty spooky, eerie kind of day out here. Okay, can you just double check or <laughs> so we got working comps. Is the comp work now? <sighs> yes. Cool. <laughs> Are the comps working? Yeah, we're just just in the sort of uh, sticking it together phase at the moment, so we'll. Uh, if you don't want that viewfinder in there, Jay. Sorry, mate. If you want to lose the viewfinder, that's fine. No, no, I just, uh, I, want, I want something. I've got no. Is there a, uh, a free hand to pass with my camera? Uh, Kurt. Yep. Could you just be on the bench there? Uh, there it is there. Yep. Yep. <coughs> this is our diver, Jasper. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> Tell us a bit about yourself, Jasper, while you're hanging off the boat. Uh, well, that is a good question. Because <laughs> I don't want to float away from the boat just while I'm hanging off it. <laughs> We've also got Erica. Hello. <laughs> Three divers today. All right. And, uh, Dome lens after that. What? Oh, the, what? the lens. Yeah, please. Without the little case on it, I'm guessing? No, uh, don't leave that on there. I get paranoid about scratching it on the way out. So we've got a lot of tech on board. Yes, we were just waiting for something to go wrong. And inevitably it does. This is, yeah. um, this is pioneering underwater live streaming. Not many people are doing this, and, uh, and Jason's um, got a pretty impressive rig together. So it's inevitable that we are a few kids, but <laughs> you're along for the ride, so it's all yeah. good. <laughs> What are we currently waiting for? Camera to come on stream. It's uh, just got a bug. Weird. It was on stream right before you jumped in. Yeah. So, Kate, you've done a bit of diving out here? Uh, not actually off Perth. No? no. <laughs> Dave would be the expert in that department. I I've done a fair bit of diving, especially between um, Fremantle and Rottnest, a little place called the Stragglers, one of my favourite little spots there. And um, I've seen our uh, iconic manta rays, some of the biggest manta rays you'll see in the world, will um, swim through there. And I remember being about 14 years of age with my dad out in, on, a, on a trip one afternoon and I saw one of these uh, lovely big creatures go past. For the first time in my life, I've never seen one, let alone, you know, see, see them on TV. And I've uh, turned around and a big black shadow went over me like this. And uh, as for a first time, when you see this impressive um, beast underwater, your, your heart rate goes a million miles an hour. And uh, so I've made a beeline up to the boat to try and tell everybody, hey, look, check it out, check it out. 
and uh, we had a little boat and the wingspan on this manta ray would have been wider than the boat and it was just amazing and so glorious to see. This is a long time ago and I'm sure they'll still come past every now and again but um, when you get to see an animal of that size and that uh, and that um, grandness just just mining its own business going through the ocean it's just an amazing thing to see so um, and uh, I mean I want to do the, the whale sharks up at Ningaloo soon uh, you know and, and seeing that sort of wildlife underwater is it's just amazing, it really is good to see. I mean, I love all the little stuff as well, but when you see some of those impressively huge beasts underwater, you've got to, got to you're, I'm, I'm always, always amazed, you know, so, um, but even the small stuff, you know, even like your little seahorses and all that sort of stuff, just the underwater world just amazes me every time, every time, there's always something you, you haven't quite seen before or, you know, you want something like, you see something and you want someone like you on board to go, well, what do you reckon that was, you know, that sort of thing, so. I hope that I can help out in that department. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I do say we know more, more about the moon than we do the ocean. Oh. The ocean's like not even, wow. it's like something not even 5% explored. Yeah, so yeah. It's always, always new stuff and always a lot of things that can be, and I, can't I, be explained just as, as of yet. And we've got one of the biggest canyons, underwater canyons, out the back of Rotnest as well, haven't we? Mm. It's like one of the deepest, it's, it's pretty, um, it translates to like the, the Grand Canyon in America for, for depth and size. There would be a lot more. Uh, well, there you go. It's usually in the oceans, usually a lot deeper. Yeah, yeah, and that's just off the back of rock nest, so mm. um, one day we'll get out there and have a bit of a look around because the depth out there is just phenomenal, but then it's just the vastness of, of, of the ocean out there and and the array of fish that we still don't know about, I reckon, around mm. there. Mm. So, um, yeah, no, we'll just any chance to get a dive in from there. Take the chance. That's it. That's it. And this is this is absolute privilege to come out here and, and show whoever wants to see online what what we do underwater, and, and that's it, it. Just feels good to be able to share it, you know, instead of just go down on your own and. You know, check out a few fish and take some photos. This forum, this getting it out online is um, almost like a dream, you know. Mm. Um, so it's really good. And we've got a, a great day for it today. We could do a little bit more sunshine, I reckon. Yeah, well, there seems to be a lot of smoke in the air that's sort of limiting the, the sunshine. Otherwise, it probably would be quite a yeah, clear day. Yeah, I'm surprised that the smoke has limited us this much. Um, but uh, yeah, but in saying that, there's a fair bit of cloud cover as well. Um, but uh, yeah, any tick of the clock, we should be sort of online with the camera. But um, I told you the story about the, the wetsuit and the spider, didn't I? <laughs> well, that was too good. We've been chatting about the perils of um, dive equipment and what, what might come along in your dive equipment. That's right. <laughs> so for everyone sitting at, at home, um, be glad there's no insects crawling into your dive equipment because Dave had a bit of a mishap. That was well, just a story. Well, that, that yeah. Well, I uh, jumped into the boat ready to go diving and I've put my wetsuit on, you know, keen as mustard. Jumped in, gone diving for my hour, then come back out yeah. and just cruising back home. I thought I was getting a bit hot, so I pulled the top off. Yeah. And as I pulled the top off, I there's a huntsman on the inside of my arm like this. And um, frightened everybody on the boat for beauty, but um, he uh, was quite wet and quite dead, unfortunately. A big spider, though. A, a very That'd big spider. <laughs> yeah. But um, so, the word to the wise is. Check your wetsuit before you put it on. <laughs> Always check your dive equipment first. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Blow some air through your regs first before you take your first breath. <laughs> that helps, yeah. I had a nasty incident with a cockroach. Yeah, he breathed at a cockroach. Oh no! I <laughs> oh. took it on the way down. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so what's it like with the with the full face comms mask? Well, I'm getting used to it. I, I you know, I. Uh, I was I was a bit hesitant to start with. Um, I thought it would be a bit restricting and confining, but if anything, it's probably more more user friendly than than it looks. Um, you can talk in it. Um, 
we will we will soon guys we're just connecting a few things up on the camera okay. um and it's uh a push to talk you touch this button here and you can hear push this button here to talk um has a rechargeable battery in here and and put this straight on onto your ear um and works through a transponder to the boat like a like a cb which is really good um so if you've got any questions yeah you can uh you can ask us and then we can relay it to dave and then if you want to see something you think you spot something you can tell us and i can get on the walkie talkie and well at one stage we had um people online asking us to go left or right so and, and that's how you can make me do it like you mm. know so, yeah, great. Get involved, guys. That's um, it. So, join in. Um, I was watching the cuttlefish uh, on C2 the other day, and just at the last where the cuttlefish was just starting to dive away, I was trying to watch on the TV where it disappeared to, and it was that well camouflaged that it, at some stage it sort of just blends so well into the, to the uh, background that you cannot even distinguish what it is and then all of a sudden it comes back out and you see the tentacles come up and you know that's the cuttlefish and not the, the seaweed but um, at one stage yeah, it literally does a complete magician disappearing act into the camouflage of the uh, the seabed and that's, uh, I watched that last night and I just thought and I watched it probably three or four times and I'm going I'm trying to keep track of that cuttlefish and it just literally disappears. It's crazy how they can shift their skin and change the colour. It's, it's amazing. So, it's yeah. one of my favourite creatures of all mm. underwater is a cuttlefish. That and the octopus um, and, and those sorts of things. But, um, but for brain power and, and for, um, for an intelligent cephalopod, mm. cuttlefish and octopus is... Uh, really amazing creatures they did a cognitive test on a cuttlefish and it had the same uh cogn cognibity i think that's the word as like a four or five year old wow so it can like differentiate shapes and sizes uh, yeah. colors i think it's colors as well yeah um, as, as like a or maybe it's a bit younger than a four or five year old so there's something crazy where it's stuck like it's to a human comparing it to a human yeah is, um, yeah. Yeah, pretty crazy. Wow. I, suppose, I suppose the only other aqua creature that would, would compare with that is the dolphin. I mean, they're, they're, they're amazing creatures. Yeah, so. well, they're a mammal. Yeah. So it's, it's like a, they're kind of like, it's not off, it's not a known thing, I suppose, not like a, I think you would think of as a mammal being in the ocean. No. Like a cephalopod is a, you know, the whole range of those creatures are all in a, mar a marine where you know you've got terrestrial mammals it's kind of like they could be on land even though they need to be in the water yes. they need to breathe they yeah need to breathe air yeah um, but you're right they are like they are the only other sort of uh, life form underwater that sort of would compete in intelligence with uh, with the octopus yeah or, yeah 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 um but yeah like you were saying before like we've okay. we've discovered very little of uh, our ocean floor in comparison to what we know about the moon mm. so, um, so there's there's been a lot of studies with with cephalopods building relationships with with their uh, uh, sort of owners i suppose with the owner or whoever like looks after them when they've done sort of sort of tests and stuff and like, you can see you've even i've had experiences underwater where you know the octopus would put out its arm and wrap around you it's just like shaking your hand saying hello which is you know it's just a weird it's like you've got this it felt like you got a connection to something like that and it's just and, the, and ones that have been uh, you know, that have, have had in tanks i guess have, have built a relationship one of them yeah and, and then there's all these stories that you can, i'm sure you can Google online yeah, of different things that have done very, where they would have gone out and always squirt water at a certain person. Oh, so there's one there's a type of an uh, well, this uh, one specific specific octopus that didn't like this certain human or, or liked it, I don't know, it depends on how they would you would perceive it, but at every time he would walk into the room room would come and squirt water at him. Wow. No matter who it like how many people there, it's always that one the one guy. Which is <laughs> Fantastic. Pretty funny. I always thought. Fantastic, yeah. I remember on, on the many many dives off the stragglers you would go in there because you would find fish that go past there all the time that you target fish for fishing um, 
and um, when I would dive around the big bombies and the, the big reefs off the stragglers, I would see the same pair of fish quite often. Not target fish for um, hunting, but target fish for us. No, not, not necessarily target fish, but just locals that used to swim in there. And that's where I did one of my first night dives in there. And, um, uh, our divers have come back in. Yes, we have. Because, uh, <laughs> hey. Oh, okay. Have we have we come to the conclusion that we might not be streaming with the camera underwater? I don't know. Okay. I'm right. not sure. But might as well just wait right here instead All right. of floating on the surface. Alright. <laughs> um always when we really need it, the tech difficulties uh, <laughs> yeah. pop up guys. Never mind. <laughs> Oh, it's impressive that um, that Yay would do this at all. Yeah. So a few blips along the way. Yeah. To be expected. Exactly. So what's it like out there? A bit cold in the water? Uh, it's about average for the area, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> I'm from California where it's like way colder than this. California's colder than this? Yeah. It's hard to believe, really. Uh, well, especially Northern California. Oh, okay. But uh, no, Southern California still, we have the Humboldt Current that comes from yep. Alaska, or from the Arctic. Yeah, the Humboldt Current, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. It goes all the way down to Mexico too, so parts of Mexico even have really cold water because of that current. Oh, okay, right. Yeah. yeah but right. where, where, where I... It's 20 minus, it's 21 degrees in the water. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank in, you, in, Jessica. 21 degrees today. Yeah. <laughs> in California, the in Northern California, it's usually between like 6 degrees and then like 13 degrees. Oh, okay. It's cold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So what are you driving in? Your dive gear wouldn't look like this. Yeah, I actually wore this mil? exact 7 mil. Oh, wow. Oh, you got a 7 mil on now. Yeah, this oh, is, okay. yeah, this is my main uh, wetsuit. Oh, okay. I used to work on a research vessel in San Diego, then we wore dry suits. Which I thought was funny because Southern California is a little bit warmer than Northern California. And I was on their team and they are like, yeah, we dive in dry suits. And I was like, really? I was diving in Northern California in 7 mil. <laughs> do you get um do you get shorter dives when it's um cold water diving like that? Um I don't think I mean probably there's probably some sort of degree of breathing difference, you know what I mean? Because you're cold, so you probably breathe a little bit more and then you'll have a bit shorter of a dive. But not anything like it's, like, it's a bit negligible, I think. I don't know. I have to look at my dive log. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and what's Tell us about dry suit diving. Ah, I, I like dry suit diving, except um, I'm very used to peeing in my suit. <laughs> and then when you when you dive in a dry suit, you can't pee. So, <laughs> so it's like you gotta tell yourself, like, no, don't do it. <laughs> or else you're gonna come up with, you know, just pee in your pajamas pretty much. You wear like, <laughs> you wear like really comfy, fluffy clothes underneath so you're warm. But then it's dry, you know? So you can be dry, um, diving in your pajamas. Yeah, basically. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> and uh, the, the job that I have with, had was like a six month long job, and they didn't want to buy a whole bunch of um, dry suit seals. So we had to cut ours really like tight. So in the beginning of the season, I was like being choked the whole time. They're like, don't worry, it'll ease up halfway through the season because we're going to be using the same ones every single day. So yeah. that was a bit tough because. <laughs> We were on a smaller boat than this, a 24 foot boat. Which is like, Jeez, that is half the size of this. Yeah. Because it's 55. There's no toilet on it, so all my coworkers and I would have to be like, all right, go to the other side of the boat. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta pee. <laughs> we got very close. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> yeah, dry suit diving is interesting too, because you gotta put weights on your feet, because the only dump oh, is up yeah. here. And so if you accidentally turn with head down and all of the air goes to your feet. Some people get dragged up, so you got to make sure you got uh, weights on your feet so your feet stay down. Lead foot. Yeah. What? Lead foot. Yeah. 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 And it's a lot more comfortable when you have weights on your feet too, because your feet just tend to be floaty, and they'll like shoot your fins off. Because oh, it's okay. like footy pajamas, you know. So uh, if the air goes right. shooting up to your feet, <laughs> yeah. you'd be upside down pretty quick. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but weights. <laughs> uh, so tell us a bit about the diving that you've done. Uh, I, so I 
I went to university in Northern California for wildlife conservation biology, and I minored in scientific diving. So uh, all my training up there was for scientific diving. I did that whole program, and I was working for Reef Check and HSU Marine Protected, no, Marine Life Protection Agency, taking data for them. And then uh, I really liked the program that I was part of, and they also have a dive master sector, so I did their dive master program as well. And then I started working for the songs which is what I was talking about from San Diego. Songs is like, what is Songs stand for? San Onofre. San Onofre Nuclear. So in San Diego, there is this nuclear power plant in San or near San Onofre, which I think is like on the border of Orange County and San Diego County. And in the 80s, it was on, and there were um, these generators underwater, and there was a mechanism to cool the generators that used ocean water. And that mechanism kicked up a bunch of sand and blacked out 179 acres of a reef. And so wildlife biologists um, made an artificial reef. It was kind of cool because they were expanding the reef the season that I did it. They take this really big barge and they get rocks from a quarry and kind of like type out the reef like a computer. There's like this big control room. That's cool. Anyways, but there's a reef that was made out of these quarry rocks. And so since the 80s, the nuclear power plant has been shut down and they employ scientific divers six months out of the year to run transects all over the reef and take data on the fish abundance, uh, uh, the macro life, the micro life, and the algae or kelp. And so that's what basically what I was doing was I did the macro life and the cryptic fish is what I was in charge of. No, yeah. So that was cool. And the, and the kelp. So yeah, so for thing. anyone wanting to get into diving, um, marine conservation, volunteering, it's a great way to do it. Get up the dives, help the environment. Yeah. There's so many different organizations that do it. Yeah, Reef Check is worldwide as well. The Reef Check that I worked for in California. I haven't found any people doing it on the west coast of Australia, but I know that there's a bunch all along the east coast. Like, Reef Check, I guess, is pretty prevalent over there, which is cool, and that's just citizen science. You don't even need a scientific diving certification. You can just uh, you just pay them some money and they train you, and then you can just come out and dive with them and take data, which is cool. There's a guy diving off um, Sydney Harbour at the moment, and he's doing a sort of like a 24 hour dive for, I don't know, for a record or something, but in, in, in that he's doing a... Um, uh, a clean up of the of the bay. He was on the news last night actually. Oh cool. Yeah, yeah. So he's sort of like just going through all the, the bottom of the the um, Sydney Harbour and uh, cleaning it up for of rubbish and all that sort of stuff while he's down there. That's oh, right. fantastic. I yeah. need to get involved with something like yeah, that. Yeah. Um, I do, don't know why we don't, we don't do scuba cleanups more often. Like, people do beach cleanups, you know? Yeah, well, there's a there's a group that does it off the um, off Fremantle um, and the river. Oh, cool. Down this way. So I don't know what site that is, but um, it's, uh, it's a, I reckon, a great idea. I mean, yeah. they, they give you free tank fills as long as you turn up. And with your gear, and oh, they'll, they'll you should get me in touch with the, the Fremantle one. I'll totally do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, it's it's pretty easy to find online, uh, yeah. but I okay. yeah. um, I'm not sure um, what the site is. But I, I do know there's a group of us, a group of people who go out specifically to clean up. Oh, so cool. I'm not that I've done it yet, but I'm very keen to, to get on board with that. So. Um, I mean, we see we see plenty of pollution on the surface and all that sort of stuff. The stuff that sinks is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of those kids that have got those uh, high-powered magnets and throw them off the, the bridges and that sort of stuff. They come up with all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Guns and trolleys and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Crazy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Take lift bags and lift all the heavy stuff too. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, there's a couple of, a couple of kids in America have uh, found cars with bodies in them and that sort of stuff. What? So we're just you get you guys back mad. in the water. Absolutely, right. Okay, we're in. It. Looks like we're back on. What, what time is it? You're not the only one. Don't ask. Okay, we've got the Dave put on his comms mask. Momentary, get rid of this.
I'll let you hop in first this time. <laughs> Okay, guys, we are <laughs> live here at um, Mindari, off the, the coast of Ooh, Western Australia. Funny. Welcome to CETO, connecting eyes to, op, uh, to oceans. Um, we have our hosts here. We have, uh, we have Kurt, we have Arnika, we have our skipper Rob, we have Erica, Hello. <laughs> Jasper, about to jump in there. And we have Dave already in the water, so hopefully we're going to have uh, our comms working. Sorry that we're a little bit late getting started. Um, my name is Jason. We're uh, we're going to uh, move the uh, the hosts to the spot that they're going to sit with you. Um, of course, always have issues with uh, with tech. That's just the way that tech works. It's just sealed. Uh, sealed. Yeah, right to go. So we're going to be. Uh, Taking our camera underwater with the divers here. Dave is our lead cameraman. We had a uh, one problem with one cable that uh, that we needed to isolate there, which was a bit of a problem for us. But um, we're right now, so I'm going to take you inside. Actually, we're going to let you have a quick look at the boat here. There's the bridge up here, the beautiful boat that we, uh, we get to use here for connecting us to oceans. We're a few kilometres offshore. There's a very bad bushfire here in Western Australia at the moment, so it's looking very gloomy out there. Um, our guys in the water now. We're going to pop in and see our guys. This area here, you can see what we see underwater that goes straight to the stream in a minute. We have our guys right here ready to help you out. Great to have you all here and uh, thanks very much to Mammals, Alex and the community for joining us here today. We're ready to introduce you to our, uh, our hosts. And here we go. All right, you should be live, guys. Awesome. Do you want to introduce yourselves and uh, tell us a little bit about you? This is for the people who have uh, just joined us from the mammal stream, um, and we'll get these uh, comms tested for for uh, our divers. Okay, awesome. Oh, well, hello to uh, the people who have just joined in. My name's Kurt. Uh, I'm a marine ecologist. I I work at Murdoch University. Uh, so I specialise in fish ecology. Uh, whether it's in the marine side or it's also I do a lot of work inside estuaries uh, but I've also been scuba diving and fishing since I've been a very young young person uh, so but yeah seeing all these kinds of fish and all that's been I should be able to help out and IDing them and then telling you a little bit about the ecosystem as well. Thanks Kurt. Hello I'm Annika. I've got a background in diving and marine conservation work um, so I've um, done a little bit of diving where we are here in Western Australia but most of my experience is on the east coast, the Great Barrier Reef and um, a little bit of work in Madagascar as well on different marine conservation projects. So yeah we're here to um, give you a bit of a guide as to what we're seeing underwater today and yeah, thanks for coming along for the ride. Awesome. Uh, so we, as you can see on the, where at the, how do we switch cameras to? Uh, yeah, okay. To so the underwater camera. To go to the underwater camera. Let's do that now. Okay, let's go. So we got the divers on the bottom, looking around. All right, let's move this over. Here we go. We'll be uh, 
should be live. Hopefully now. All right, we're going to switch back to you guys for a tick. You keep talking. Uh, so where we are at the moment, we're just off the coast of Perth. So we're in a subtropical region, which is kind of uh, intermediate between tropical, which is your Great Barrier Reef uh, over on the east coast. But over here, we've got the Ningaloo Reef. Uh, and then we're near the temperate region, uh, which we're in the in-between stage. We're probably closer to the temperate uh, region here where we are in Perth. So we just, majority we're going to be seeing uh, temperate fishes uh, or temperate uh, any type of fauna. And uh, we might have the odd chance of seeing a temperate, uh, sorry, a, a tropical, any tropical species. Uh, generally, you see that more in the summertime when the water's a bit warmer and they'll come down through uh, the Lewin current. Uh, but this time of year, the water has cooled off a little bit, so most of your tropical species head back up north, uh, back to the warmer waters that they're used to. Uh, although we did find out the water is reasonably quite warm at 21 degrees uh, here, which generally on the temperate regions more sits around the 17, 18 uh, degree range. So, yeah, hopefully well, when the cameras get back up, we'll be able to show you what's down there. We have had a cyclone come through uh, more north from here in the last week or so. Uh, seemed to have brought down a bit of swell and made the water a little bit murky. Uh, you can see it when the divers go back under, it's a little bit turbid down there. Uh, still have enough visibility, maybe between 5 to 10 metres visibility. Uh, so we should be able to see the things there, but usually the water can be a lot clearer down here about the 20 metres uh, visibility, which is, makes pretty awesome diving uh, out this part of the coastline. Yep, your divers are always chasing good visibility. <laughs> Uh, but the good thing is when the visibility is low you can get right up close um, and you often see more. And when it's a bit overcast like it is today we tend to see a bit more fish. Um, it's a bit more active under the water. I don't know why. Do you have an explanation for that Kurt? For, sorry, but the... Oh, I've, just from my personal experience diving I've found that on overcast days um, the underwater world is a bit more active. It seems like there's more going on. Yeah, yeah. There, uh... I wouldn't say it's explained scientifically, uh, but I could have come up with a theory to why. Uh, so a lot of fish will be more active during the overcast days because the visibility is less, so overhead prey uh, can't spot them as easy. So they're more be likely to be roaming around, foraging for food or, or whatever they're doing uh, during the overcast days, where as in when it's bright, they would generally go and hide uh, because they're obviously gonna be easier spotted by, by predators. Uh, so most fish usually have like a cat returning on the, depending on where they sit in the water column, whether it's uh, demersal or uh, or pelagic, they would usually be sort of some type of carpet counter shading, which means they will generally be uh, darker on top and then lighter under the bottom. So that way it works that if uh, any predators over the swimming over the top and look down on them, they kind of the darker colours blend into the darker floor where if they're looking up underneath them, the whiter colours sort of blend into the lighter surface, which is obviously the sky or the sun. Uh, where on overcast days, uh, the silhouettes or whatever of, of the or whatever or fish swimming around is less visible, uh, so they will be more likely to roam around. On no, so hopefully that helps with the explanation a little bit. Great, okay. thanks Kurt. Yes. Uh, okay, well hopefully the fish are feeling safe and they'll be out and about for <laughs> <Yeah>. us today. <laughs> oh, we we're just about there guys. Shall we switch to the underwater cam? Um, not quite, in a sec. I'm just going to make sure that that is right. Alright, you've got your view there. Alright, should be right. Awesome. Cool. Cool. So the sea, what we can see down there at the moment is is a lot of kelp. So this is called Eclonia radiata, which is uh, mainly this is probably the most common uh, algae uh, in the in the area that we are in. So this is, has like a hold fast, which is, uh, will hold onto a rock. So gen you will never get kelp uh, living in sand. So they have to have like a they have like a their root system, you would call it, I guess. It's not technically a root system, but they would hold on to something, some type of substrate uh, that doesn't move.
Uh, also, with the kelp, that uh, it does provide a huge habitat for a lot of fish um, that will hide in between and swimming around. So, oh, here's, here goes our first fish. So this is a male uh, western king wrasse. So these guys here, uh, generally you'll get one or two of these and they'll, they'll be a pack of females, which will be a lighter white colour with a red stripe. So this guy, uh, these guys have a dimorphism, so they'll... Uh, start off they'll be born a female and be living in a group and then when the the male dies or moves on uh the, the fastest growing female will then turn into a male so usually males are quite inquisitive and be, uh, quite uh, protective of their little col of the colony but don't don't see the colony yet but as you can see this guy's swimming around checking checking dave out So if you've got any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. I'm not sure if we've had much chatter. Yeah, there's yeah. been a few people just, uh, just looking if there was many questions. Algae can be uh, broadly grouped into three uh, three phylum of algae. So you got your Phaeophyceae, which is you would call like your brown algae. Your uh, I just had a mental blank. Rhodophyta, which is your red algae, uh, which is a, the most common uh, type of algae, and then the green algae, which I've completely just mind blanked on. Uh, starts with C. And I've completely forgotten it. And isn't it beautiful, just the hypnotic sway of the of the algae and the current? It's absolutely hypnotizing when you're under there. We just had a question come through from, from Elizabeth asking how deep the water is. So I think the divers are diving between 8 to 10 metres of water at the moment. Just see if you can catch Dave on comms and then ask him if he'll be able to have a look at his equipment. Alright. Great, let's get Dave. Can you hear me Dave? Oh, we have a question coming through. Uh, how deep are you at the moment? Oh, there we go, so 9.1 metres. Did you say 9 metres? Yeah, 9.1, yeah. So that fish there is a scaly fin. Uh, sort of, so these guys are very territorial. They'll actually chase any fish or, or shark of any size trying to protect their little home. So they will actually be very, uh, they would, they would uh, be very territorial. That will be its little home there. So that's that one there. Uh, might be Magullic scaly fin, so they'll be that one. There would be a male and a female, also known as damsel fishes. Ah, uh, so we've got a couple of questions coming through. Uh, Pam's asking, what type of sharks are in the area? Ah, uh, we get a whole range of sharks, but so. hopefully none right now. <laughs> so I think the divers are hoping not to see to see any sharks underwater. Uh, at the moment, but you'd get anything from your whaler sharks to uh, like your you do you get the odd great white shark, uh, your, your mako sharks. Uh, the fish we got on stream now is a banded sea sweep, uh, and then you also get all your shovel noses uh, and your stingrays and all that as well. So there's a huge range of sharks, but the most common sharks you get here are definitely your uh, whaler sharks. Beautiful. So we're looking at a limestone cave here. There's a lot of limestone in this area. 
which provides an important habitat for the fish. Oh, here we go. So here's uh, your crayfish or lobsters. So this is the western western rock lobster. They look pretty decent size as well. So they're uh, really quite tasty. I think that they've also you can see. If, uh, so there's a female there and a male. So it doesn't look like it's got got eggs, but they'll hold out their tail and then the little on their tail they've got the little little flippers that they'll aerate the eggs, keeping water and oxygen going going through them. Um, but they seem to be yeah, quite quite cruisy. One's coming up to check. They've actually got really poor eyesight. So you can see they've got two really large antennas and then two smaller ones that have forked. Um, and those two smaller ones is what they use for to finding out what's around. They're very quite sensitive. So as you can see, they're moving around trying to figure out what what, what the what's in front of them. So they can because of their poor eyesight. And you can see there it's moving around trying to touch and feel what they're what they're sensing. So western rock lobsters can live up to 25 to 30 years of age. So they they'll get quite a lot bigger than that that they're seeing there. Uh, but to by the time to reach uh, a size, a legal size to catch, they take about four years. So they'll uh, breed. Uh, well, I think, was, that a, was that a fish that they just had in front? Um, they'll they'll breed and uh, release all their eggs, uh, and then that will go. They'll go into the water column and then drift out with the water uh, into with the water currents. Ah, so the fish that we've got on screen now uh, are the juvenile Western King Rass. So as we saw the male earlier, that is the female. So those ones we got on screen, they're very quite young. Uh, they're, they're definitely still very much in the juvenile stage. Uh, so they would not be at breeding stage there. But you can see that the, a few of the larger ones are more part, like pale white with just the one red stripe. And that's your the more the fem typical female. Very cool to see a, a large group at that stage. So at that age, they probably be only, only uh, probably under a year year age, years one year of age, um, and they'll start reaching maturity after a year. <laughs> We've got a question just come through: Is the diver worried, or are the divers worried about anything that can bite or sting? Uh, I don't think they will be, otherwise they won't be in the water. Uh, Attacks and all that are very quite rare around here. You've got to be very, very unlucky. Uh, and most most sharks uh, will actually just be inquisitive. Uh, they will have a look and they'll then swim off, um, which is quite common. So then we've got here is the blue spotted goatfish, and then that's and a western talma. So the goatfish is the one on the bottom, and then the talma is the one that's swimming upside down on the top. And then we just had on screen. Oh, and we have a cuttlefish. So this is your cephalopod. Uh, if you were listening to before, they've, that they've got uh, chromatophores that can change colour, uh, and they can also move their skin. So they've got like neurons that we have also in our brain throughout their skin, and they can change and take shape uh, and be very well camouflaged. And they're also very quite smart, or quite an intelligent uh, creature. As you can see, it's definitely sussing us out. Uh, wondering whether to be scared or afraid, so uh, they have it. He hasn't shot up, so when they're uh, quite afraid or he's been territorial, he'll hold two of his tentacles out and then two up in the air, kind of like he's uh, ready to to fly kickers. Uh, but at the moment, he seems quite quite calm and just checking checking out, checking us out. Feels quite safe, so he hasn't gone into any any cars. Wow, amazing! How lucky are we to be seeing this right now? I've done a lot of dives and I've only seen one cuttlefish before. Uh, Yanni is asking, what has been your most breathtaking underwater moment? Hmm. I think for me it would have to be uh, swimming with manta rays. Uh, they really are like the birds of the ocean, you know, it's, it's like you're flying when you're swimming with manta rays. So if you ever get the opportunity to do that, that's a that's an amazing experience, um, and I think for me chasing a chasing a turtle underwater on a night dive was probably my number two. 
Night dives are pretty spooky. No, uh, no light. Closest thing to uh, being in space, I think. <laughs> and turtles are really slow, so it was quite a, a meditative experience following this turtle at this turtle pace. What about you, Kurt? Um, really had to think about that. It's definitely had quite a, quite a few great experiences on the water. It's always, as uh, Dave was mentioning earlier, that it's no dive is ever the same. It's always something different. Uh, probably one of the best moments I did have was uh, I was just free diving um, down on the south coast and I had a mum and baby uh, a southern right whale come up behind me. Uh, I had no idea that they were there and I turned around and there was two ginormous uh, creatures directly behind me and that was uh, pretty pretty awesome just to check them out and, and see the, the, the size of how big they actually are. Uh, which Never looks the same when you're when you're on the surface underwater. Everything's magnified, and then being right up right up next to them was pretty awesome. Dave, come in. Can you hear us? Excellent. What are the conditions like down there, mate? Good. Looks like we've found a, uh, a few nice sights for our viewers so far. So that's the school of, uh, well the scientific name is Chorus Acularis, but of Western King Rass. So part of the, the Labrid family. And then there was the Talma swimming around at the same time as well. Sorry, Dave, can you please repeat? So that wrasse there is, looks like a senator wrasse. So that one would look like the, the green wrasse that we saw was a male. Uh, it's off screen now. This, oh, and we've got a leather jacket here, uh, which could be the six spine leather jacket. Leather jackets are one of the hardest uh, fish to ID. I've found uh, you've even sometimes you even have to, to ID in between different species is look at the vertebrate inside, uh, which obviously you can't do to a live animal. But uh, they are absolutely awesome creatures. Beautiful. It's quite unreal having the opportunity to dive here in these um, limestone outcrops. Pop your head under there, and it's just a whole nother world. Mm. couple of questions coming through. They're not coming up on here. Uh, yeah, but um, the people who are viewing on mammals, we're getting the questions sent through separately. Uh, so that there is a female brown spotted wrasse. Now we're looking like we're going to go back into another cave. Ali Straza says, I want to scuba in Oz someday whenever I get my certifi certification. Yes, you should. So that there is, an, is the scaly fin as well. Uh, there's quite a, there's probably four or five species of scaly fin that will, um, that you could, uh, will, def will find in this, in this area uh, to identify between them. Uh, definitely need to be able to see a little bit more of the features that they have. And the fish swimming upside down is the Western Talma, and right in front of us is, we have the, we have the, cuddle, the cuddle fish again. You can see how he's quickly changing colours, and see how he's put up his two tentacles there, so he's starting to feel a little bit distressed, uh, but seems to be quite, because if, oh, he's swimming right up. So he's quite a large one, this fella. Uh, awesome to be able to see how he's changing colours so quickly. So they'll use their colours to either threaten or, or show that they're feeling alright, but... I think why, why is everything down and coming up so close now is actually feeling quite safe and just, just seeing what's going on. So 
So Pam's asking, are we seeing any type of corals or just plant life? What's this colourful um, substrate that we're seeing here? So you've got a lot of ascidians growing, which ascidians are like uh, your sea squirts or uh, growing over the rocks there. Uh, then there's also types of algae, there's little bits of uh, soft corals and hard corals. Uh, growing on there, so there's uh, a lot of red, al a lot of its red algae, which is like you know, the rotifida, which is um, like a coralline algae, which grows over substrates like that. Uh, you also have a lot of sponges, uh, and then we've got is a, the main uh, large uh, algae seen there is the Eclonia radiata, which is a kelp, uh, which you've also may have heard of uh, kelp forest, which grow more over in the eastern states of Australia uh, or over elsewhere in the world as well. Uh, but this this species of kelp here only grows to about one and a half. Coral that's only found in this area, guys. So as a uh, a coral researcher, this is probably a bit of a jackpot for him for this dive. So do you mean this is native to this area in the entire world, David? Oh wow, it's like really spongy, look at that. Here I was thinking that it was hard, but wow. So how are you guys finding the stream quality? Is this good enough for us to say final test over and done with and we should start properly streaming for the new project? So as I've mentioned to you guys before, I mean, um, Nathan, who's under there at the moment, is um, our lead diver. He's a commercial diver, a saturation diver. This, the guys who go kilometres underwater um, and stay for three weeks in a, uh, a compression chamber. And David, who's uh, been doing most of the talking here with us, is a marine biologist, um, the uh, president of the Murdoch University Divers Club. All right, I'm going to take our picture and picture off so uh, you guys can enjoy the view. Yeah, wow. It's very clear down there. There's a lot of visibility. I still think... I still think that I need... Oh, is that an eel? Yeah, it is. Um, I still think that I need to diffuse those lights a bit more. See, it's a, a little bit glary still. Oh, is it because of the light coming in? Um, no, no, no. I'm talking about the the light from uh, from the unit. Oh wow! Actually, that wasn't a an eel. That was an octopus. Uh, okay, welcome uh, again to the stream. We are live here underwater with a couple of our scuba diving friends. One of them is a marine biologist. Uh, her name is Kat. She is uh, the one operating the camera here looking for exciting stuff to show you. Um, the other one, uh, Cameron, is an avid uh, fisherman and hunter. Um, he's the guy that you'll see on camera quite a bit with uh, Oh, 
sponsor. Oh, no. All right, you're back now, guys. Sorry about that. Um, so we're back right. streaming underwater again. We had a, uh, a question come in from Rob Whitehair. Uh, such an amazing stream. Can you tell us about the issues affecting ocean health that you are seeing in Western Australia? Also, apologies for the stream going offline for a second. That was actually my fault. I didn't check the, uh, the batteries and we, <laughs> we actually lost power on the streaming equipment. But yeah, we're good now. Uh, so, issues along West Australia's coastline, there's obviously quite a few that's happens, uh, that's also happening worldwide. Uh, the main one is the water temperatures heating up, uh, so that obviously everything that is, that's living in this area is adapted to what the water temperature has, uh, is usually, uh, and then when it heats up to a certain extent and then stays at that temperature for a, a vast time, uh, they can't handle. Uh, and they haven't been to seem to be able to, to adapt as quick. So the biggest things that have usually been affected are either seagrasses, um, which are super important uh, for our ecosystem, uh, and then also our Eclonia radiata, which is that brown kelp you're seeing there, uh, is also having has have had lots of impacts uh, from water temperatures heating up, uh, and that uh, a lot of it seems to be dying off. Uh, and then there's a lot of other impacts as well, uh, whether it's uh, anthropogenic or or uh, climate, uh, which is the main main things. But we seem to have found a nice cave here uh, with quite a few different species of fish. Um, I think we've got here is a buff brim or silver, sorry, not a buff brim, a silver drummer. Uh, so this is from the Kyphosis family, and that you can actually there is quite a few species of these fellas. Uh, in that we might see, uh, there could be up to so six different species um, of fish, but they do grow quite large. What we saw on screen there was uh, the silver drummer, which do grow to just under a metre long, uh, which is reason, which is a large fish. And here you start seeing uh, our, some ascidians, and we've also got some of the siphons, um, which is oh, mental blank. Why have I said it just before? Oh, a nerdy brain. Oh, and a little nerdy brain. Oh, look at that. So that there is like kind of like what you'd see, like a sea slug. Um, so it's like a very awesome colours. So there's so many different species of these of these guys, and always very brightly coloured. That's a highlight for sure. Dive is always chasing nerdy brain. <laughs> Have you seen as Jasper got his camera down there? Because he's an avid photographer as well. So you might have seen one of the divers. Does he look like he's taking photos? Um, yes, yeah, he's coming over now just to take a few photos. Nice. Looks like some tide corals on that limestone mount. So that wrasse that we're seeing up there is called a black spotted wrasse. So they don't grow much larger than that. Uh, oh, there seems to be quite a few. Um, maybe I can tell by looking on them. The, there's a bit of glare on the screen right now, so it's a bit hard to see. Uh, that's there is the male Western King Rass, and then the other one's the male Brown Spotted Rass. So we saw the female a little bit earlier, um, and not, then the male came along, which is quite large. So uh, all all Labrid species start off as female, uh, and then once they will generally have a dominant male around them, and then when the dominant male uh, dies or disappears, uh, the it's not the largest female, it's the fastest growing female that will then turn into a male. So those there are your females of the Western King Rass. You can see out there, actually, they look sexually mature at that, at when they've got that more of that whiter and then that one red stripe. Uh, earlier we saw the juveniles. 
which uh, predominantly red with the white stripe. Oh, and there seemed to always also been a goat fish uh, in there as well. Probably the blue spotted goat fish, even though it's got a pink stripe. So we've been lucky enough to see quite a lot of uh, different species down there tonight or today. Yeah, yeah, it's been um, been pretty awesome and, and diverse in, in the fish species. Uh, and also seeing the cuttlefish, and as you can tell, I'm not an algae expert, but there seems to be lots of different algaes and sponges, and and all, all inhabiting uh, the same area on the limestone. I'd like to take this opportunity to um, uh, thank uh, mammals, the crew at mammals, the community that's been watching, asking questions, and um, it, we're really proud to have been part of the community spotlight today. Um, we've been given the go-ahead to go for a bit longer, so we're going to continue showing you these uh, underwater scenes up until the divers have to come up, um, and then we'll have a quick chat to them before we sign off for the night to finish off your community spotlight stream. So we just saw on screen the silver drummer, uh, and he's back there again. So those guys usually can swim in large schools, so where you see one you'll most likely see a few more. Uh, this guy seems to be swimming a bit lonesome at the moment, um, and he's quite a large fella. So you can also see how I was sort of talking earlier about uh, counter shading within fish. So you can tell that the, dark, the top the top half of the silver drummer there is a darker colour to his bottom half, which seems to be a lot like a lot lighter silver, uh, and that's so he can blend in uh, from uh, either bottom or top uh, predators when they're looking for hunting. Certain uh, fish species prefer types of habitats as well, so. Uh, being that we're on a reef, we're, we're going to see a lot more reef species. But there's a lot of species that live in different parts of the water column, uh, that or different types of habitats. So either you've got your seagrass or your or your just uh, sand. Uh, here we've got this. That, that's a scaly fin or damsel fin fish, also known as a, uh, also could be a par palmer. Um, and then in the back, I think we may have seen a herring kale. Uh, although it's gone off screen now, so I can't confirm. I just heard, guys, that um, that the fundraising goal for Cool Earth was uh, was smashed in Damien Explores stream uh, prior to us, which is awesome to see. They were hoping to raise a thousand US dollars, and they got to eleven hundred and thirty so far. Uh, that goal is still open, guys. So if you are, uh, are willing and able to help support such a good cause. Uh, you've got a link that you can uh, check out just below in the mammal stream. If you want to check out the mammal stream, it's mammals with a Z, M A W M A L Z dot com, and you'll be able to see the stream uh, also on there as well as our usual, usual, uh, usual socials. We're going to put our socials in stream at the moment, you so uh, you can also get the, that info as well, please like subscribe etc and i'll give you back to kurt and we have a, a sea fan oh no sea fan sorry like a a type of uh polychaete or worm i'm pretty sure that the yellow thing uh flying around or something there so it's those fronds there is what it uses to catch uh food that's uh flowing through the water uh, and then it lives in its uh, like a calcareous tube um, if it was disturbed, it will quickly suck back up uh, to hide. Uh, although it looks like it was uh, enjoying the currents that are around them, hopefully getting a nice feed. So it seems to be a quite a large school of the Western King Rass swimming around. On the reef, and that fish there that's yellow with the stripes is called a footballer sweep. So they are also usually swimming in large schools. Uh, although that one seems to be enjoying the swim by itself.
Uh, we've had a question come through from SMF01998. How often do you do these underwater streams? Uh, well, Cedo's still in its infancy. I, I believe this is the fourth stream that we've done live. So Jason seems to have a, a fairly large team of people uh, to help to help out. Um, as we were just saying, that it's the very the start of of Cito, so it's, he's getting the ground, the ball rolling, and then we're coming along to volunteer and help out. I think uh, what, what he's doing is sharing this uh, amazing bit of coastline and people that we're able to go diving with. Everyone's pretty important. Um, be able to do this and see this and, and hopefully ignite a lot of passion uh, for people to want to learn or or protect uh, these awesome environments. Got a comment coming through from Pam Buff. I love all of the tiny creatures you are showing us. Yes, we're pretty blessed to be able to see this and to share it with you all. Jason, have you got some more streams planned coming up? Yeah, for sure. Um, we're going to be trying to do uh, as many as many pseudo streams as possible. Hopefully we can get down to maybe one a week. Um, just obviously weather dependent because we want to pick the really good days to be able to head out um, because it's easier on the divers and we get to see more. Um, but by all means, please follow the socials and uh, keep in touch and we'll let you know when we're heading out. I think here's a, was a bit of a good example of the scaly fins uh, not enjoying other fish uh, getting into their area. As you can see, they were uh, protecting their little, little home, chasing off the, the two rats. Oh, so that there amazing. is the male brown spotted wrasse. Uh, we saw a female swimming around, swimming around earlier. And here we've got a gold spotted sweet lip. Uh, we just had a donation come through for Cool Earth from uh, Ali Strasse. Thank you very much for that. Fantastic. Okay, Dave, come in. Just wanted to see how much time how much time have you guys got left down there? I'm asking you how much time you've got left. Uh, okay. I missed that. Repeat, please. Must be just out of range there. <laughs> Uh, we've had a question come through from Janet. Have you had any scary or close calls while diving? Kurt, have you got any stories to share? Uh, yeah, I've got a few. Um, I have had quite a few experiences with sharks. Uh, not so much. I've only had one, uh, which is called we call a wobbygong here, uh, actually bite me. I had a wobbygong biting my leg. I've had a wobbygong. Uh, had a go at my chest, but they've got small mouths, so they don't actually reach around and get anything, which is pretty lucky. lucky. Um, I've had sharks steal fish off me a fair bit. Um, I do rely on a shark shield. Uh, I've had a, uh, a whaler shark uh, try and steal a fish off me, uh, but the shark shield works, gratefully. Um, I've also also have had the mild terms of the bends before, which was never a good thing. Uh, that was a a silly mistake of myself doing some things, so definitely take precaution and uh, listen to what you learn when you do your dive course, and then I'm sure you'll be fine. Uh, and I've also have lost the boat 
uh, through an anchor and then had to swim to shore. So I've had uh, had a few, few, quite a few, uh, <laughs> few things that have happened while while scuba diving before. Um, but definitely uh, uh, take precautions and uh, don't think that yourself is invincible under there because it is uh, quite a wild world. Um, but generally, you can always be. Is that a shark shield there? Shark shields are a long wire that hangs off the back of your fin. Is that? Yeah, yeah. There's a few different types of shark shields, uh, but the one that we're I'm um, talking about uh, is like a, a long wire because uh, sharks have very sensitive noses. Uh, because well, which is part of what they have on their what in their nose for Ampullae lorenzi, which is like fluid-filled sacs where they can pick up uh, pulses in the water, um, and then because they're so sensitive that a shark shield sends out electric pulses uh, usually every 0.7 seconds. And when a shark gets into a certain uh, distance of that, that it is uh, being with their sense of nose that it's too strong and they will actually be repelled away. Uh, which could also bring them in to a certain extent, being uh, feeling that. So if they're a long way away, they would sense that. As you know, that sharks can uh, smell or feel things from a long distance away. Uh, but then when they get to a certain certain distance, that it's too strong for them and they will not... not uh, harm you. <laughs> Alright, Dave, are you guys heading back to the surface? <laughs> Roger that, we'll start pulling that cable in. Uh, Sabrina's asked a question, Is are those fish on a meeting on a rock? Uh, I think you might be talking about the scaly fin, um, and I suppose they are kind of in a meeting, so usually it'll be like a male and a female, uh, and they'll be protecting their little home uh, where there is, they've got a little, nice little grazing patch uh, where, they, where they seem to farm for food or they can, I've also seen them uh, fertilise areas uh, where a female will be shivering and the male will be swimming behind uh, laying, uh, fertilising her eggs. Uh, unless you're talking about the big school uh, which was the school of Western King Rass and they just stay in safety in numbers and they'll be just swimming around happily as day, probably eating or doing just going by about their day. Did we see a pencil urchin before? There was an urchin when you yep. were um, telling your shark story. Um, sometimes you can find those the little spines of the urchins um, in the sand. And you can you can actually write write with them. <laughs> hmm. I guess that's how they get the name. There you go. I did not know that. That's cool. Our driver is coming up for a safety stop now. So they're returning back to the boat. I believe. So. Dive. I haven't been in the water myself for a little while and that was just absolutely unreal. I really felt like I was there on the dive with these divers. Bubbles. Alright, you can't see much now, right? Because no. they're on their way back, yep. back up. Yep. Yep. Okay. Now. Yep. If you've got any other other questions, feel free to uh, to ask now. Um, the divers coming up, so we're going to switch back to our our uh, hosts and I'm going to do it to this camera so that it can take you outside. All right, we should be back, I believe. Cool, do you want to come up and uh... Okay, let's meet the divers on the deck. Kurt, I'll let you take the, uh, take the camera, take the camera, take the reins. Yep. 
Oh wow, conditions are pretty good out here now. The smog's lifting. We've had a bit of a bushfire today that's brought some smog across. <laughs> so the question come, came through from uh, Sneaky Che and uh, Jespin both said hi. And uh, Sneaky Che asks, what happens if a shark comes? Uh, I think the, <laughs> the safest thing is probably just to stay there, hold your ground. Um, sharks can sense fear. Uh, they can definitely probably sense your, your heart rate as well. So if you start acting erratic, they'll probably start acting erratic. Um, How can you control that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so a, a shark, they're, they're never going to... If they're acting er uh, erratic, they generally are in a hunting feeding mode, so probably the best idea would be to probably stay close to the ground if you've got enough enough air, because they're not going to... And if the two people stay close together. Yeah, if they stay close together as well is also another another thing. Um, but if you're going to try swing away and all that, they probably would start Chase. Chase. chasing you. So. And just, uh, I guess, just be calm and then just take in the moment of uh, swimming with the shark. So we're going to be able to capture the uh, the guys popping up with the dive shortly as well. Uh, I think we've got bubbles coming out this side, so... Uh, we had a question come through from Pam. What kind of sea urchins did we yeah. see? Oh, well, I saw a pencil urchin. What urchins did you see? Not very good at my uh, urchin identification. I'm more fish. <laughs> And I only know the common name, so we'll stick with pencil urchins. Thanks, Pam. Sneaky Trey and Justine, say hello. Hello. Thanks for when you can see bubbles. One, the two, right three. number. Always <laughs> count. <laughs> Rob's our skipper, he's keeping us safe today. So you can probably explain the reason why they uh, they hang down there at five metres for a little while, guys. So this is called a decompression stop. Um, go with the dive instructor, but did you want <laughs> Yeah, it's good. We need to do a safety stop um, on most dives in order to make sure that <laughs> we just lost the camera there. Yeah, I got it. In order to make sure that we're not going to suffer any. Um, so Kurt shared earlier that he had um, a slight case of the bends, uh, and that would be the colloquial term for decompression. Want to get so. Um, in scuba diving, it's really important to make sure that your ascent is slow, uh, no faster than your smallest bubble. Yep. And um, so they're just having a really slow ascent now and they're taking a little bit of a break as they ascend at five metres uh, to decompress, to let some of that nitrogen um, go through the system. And here we are, we've got surface. Hello! Hi! Hi! Hi. 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 What a dive! Hey guys! <laughs> Welcome back. Alright, we'll bring our, uh, our camera over this way. Yep. Yeah. He's still in there, what's he doing? He's he might be checking the anchor. Holy 
Sorry. So it's uh, quite uncomfortable being a scuba diver out of the water. <laughs> so they were experiencing weightlessness um, underwater, uh, which they have now lost. <laughs> Feeling like they weigh 100 kilos. How's the dive? Whew. Thanks for taking us with you. It was an incredible dive. Well, it was a good dive. Uh, Less, less smoky than it was up here. <laughs> but, uh. You got it. <laughs> some, there was some good fish in there. Yeah, yeah, it seems to be quite a few fish swimming around. Yeah. Quite diverse. There was a. Uh, Sweet! Yeah. Yep. I got some cool shots of you shooting the cuttlefish. Oh, yeah, Did, cool. Could you see me underneath the ledge on the other side? Not really. I oh. was. I was. On, I had the camera under there. Well, I. I, oh. I had a really cool view of you videotaping. Oh right. I'll show you. Yeah, yeah. So I have videos of you videoing as well. <laughs> Very good. Let's see. Uh, see. Wow, like a, that's clear. Yeah. That's really good. It's like. Sorry. I was from this other, <laughs> Sorry, other side guys. of the cave. We're reviewing. Yeah, reviewing. I know. Huh? <laughs> I got a bunch. It just, oh, it's a, just really a really cool, cool shot. Yeah, it is. And then I got. All right, I can take oh, nice. on that one if you like. Well, he was he was so cool. He was coming yeah, in and trying to be a fish. Yeah. The last time we were out. Yeah. We um, he was swimming along and he was like looking like grief and looking like kelp. I love yeah. how they change their, they change their texture as well as their mm. color. Yes, this one's super cool. Hey, he seemed really curious too, that one. Yeah, yeah. You know, cuttlefish remember. They do? Yeah. No, no. All good. All right, Janet, so oh, thanks for the trip okay. down under. Yeah. Um, that's all right. We've been uh, really happy. We've got a couple of questions for the divers. I know you guys are starting to get. Uh, ready in that? Um, We're we trying Erica, to get what? Erica here. Hi. We've got Dave over here. We've got yep. Jasper just getting his VCD off there. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks for the dive down under. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and um, yeah, and down under said for generator sure. too. And uh, the other question <laughs> was, for the divers, what was your favorite part of the dive today? Let's ask I mean, Erica to start with. The cuttlefish, of course. Cuttlefish, of course, yeah. <laughs> I nice. De I de definitely the cuttlefish. Yeah. And we had a, um, a big, uh, what was it, not a, was it a brim? What? A, a where's, where's the other? What's it, black cream? Nah, it the big a black and white one, what was it oh, called? No, no, no. The big, it was really good, real yes. big size. But yeah, the cuttlefish is always a star of the show. Yep. So, nice. uh, yeah. And how about you, Jasper? I missed the cuttlefish. Oh. <laughs> oh. He, but was, he was right down on the loo. That's a really nice swim throughs. Yep. Um, lots yeah, of true. good ledges and yeah. limestone caves are pretty cool. Yeah. Excellent. And yeah. you had your camera down there, your your really expensive camera. How many did I you get I wouldn't say a shots? really expensive camera. Um, <laughs> no, the light was very challenging. Was um, it? Okay. Well, and it uh, the aperture is just not big enough, so. I don't think many of them come out very well. Actually. Right. Oh, well. <laughs> can always hope. No, nah, it wasn't the best day to leave the strobes at home. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, excellent. Uh, are there any big changes that we've noticed over the years? Um, you've been, if you've been diving in for for a long time, environmental changes in species, populations, whatever. I'm not sure who the right person to ask this one would be, but it is a very good question. Uh, I think he's inside. Kurt would be the man to yeah. ask for that. Uh, what about you, Dave? Have you, you've been diving off these waters for quite a long time. Have yeah. you noticed any changes yourself? Just less of the, the bigger pelagic stuff, like less of, less of the big fish. Um, I don't know if it's overfishing or it's the wrong time of the season, but um, I was really happy to see a big silver and black fish under there. Um, because they're sort of like target fish for um, scuba divers and uh, for um, um, spear fishermen and that sort of stuff. So it's good to see a big healthy one down there, but he looked like he had a good hiding spot. So um, maybe that's why he's big and fat and happy. <laughs> but um, in that little ledge there, in that little limestone cave is one of my favorites because the dive previous to that, you, you couldn't move for fish under there. 
like the like that was probably about ten percent of what we saw last time, which was down there now. And there was a few down there now, but last time we were down there, there would have been literally ninety percent more fish and more activity down there. Obviously, there was more light as well. But um, it is honestly one of my favourite little spots there because that, that place at the right time and the right conditions is alive. It's like literally swimming in an aquarium um, that the fish can't get away from you. So, but they hang around in there and it, it's a really cool little spot. Um, but there are spots like that all over the coast here. Just got to know where to go. All right, well guys, our divers are going to be getting uh, pretty cold. Right now, so we've got well, one of them more than others. <laughs> let, let them start to uh, to get themselves sorted. Yeah. Um, looks like we're out of questions. I'd like to say thank you very much to divers for coming out and uh, volunteering your time today to to uh, join us and bring such amazing sights to uh, everyone from under the water. Thank and, um, you, Josh. Arnika, thank you for joining us. First time, CEDO member. Good to have you here. Thanks for having me. It's been great. And uh, we'll go in and say bye to Kurt, wherever he is. Oh, he's, he's in the bathroom, sorry. <laughs> Alright, we're just saying a quick bye to you, mate, before we uh, before we sign off and head back to Mammals. Thanks very much for your uh, informative uh, insights. No, and, thank you. Thank um, you. And yeah, it was, uh, it was really good. Um, um, I would like to say, though, if you, uh, anyone wants to check out the science page uh, or a podcast, I have a podcast called uh, Paramount Importance. Uh, we should be streaming on any... Uh, any platform um, and then if you want to keep in up to date with what I've been researching uh, we've got Instagram and Facebook as well. So. Awesome, uh, repeat it again. Uh, Paramount Importance. Paramount Importance, excellent, thanks very much for that and uh, always great having you here mate. Uh, thank You're you. The Fish Encyclopedia we like to uh, <laughs> nickname you but uh, we'll catch you later. Thanks very much again to Mammals and the crew and we look forward to catching you next time. So we've got a little bit of a, a joint test stream happening here and um, we wanted to see how good a quality we could get. Let's, uh, let's try something and hopefully I don't fall in because <laughs> that would be bad. I'm just going to see if I can uh, chuck us into the water just a little bit here. Alright, so hopefully you'll be able to see the bottom there without me getting too wet. There, whoop, there we are. He almost lost me. That would have been funny. That'd <laughs> be almost the second. <laughs> that would have been almost the second time that I've uh, I've just about fallen in water while I've been streaming.